your potential and then in fact opportunities for you you know being studying at iit indore and that means you know the sky is the limit and you know, really anything is possible in your lives believe in yourselves and then really aim high and work hard and smart and then you know really you know sky, literally sky is the limit i just want you to keep that one in mind don't put any barriers in your own mind most of the time we put barriers in our own mind and those barriers are the ones which limit us please break those barriers and never give up okay? thank you okay. thank you sir that, thank you. and uh, so really uh, once again i want to thank uh, you know all all the colleagues from iit indore for inviting me to participate uh, uh, in this uh, you know the, in this uh, series and i want to thank uh, mayank and pawan and mukesh and uh, everybody who is involved in this particular program has been mentioned that sure i will be really speaking about sure the you know semiconductor nanostructures for optical electronics applications and in addition to being at the australian national university i have appointed honorary appointments in india and japan and china and taiwan and us and uk so really it's a pleasure for me to be associated with these universities and uh, institutions and then i want to thank them for inviting me to be uh, giving me an honorary appointments in their institutions it's really been a pleasure so before proceeding further, and I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators. And uh, so uh, really the, this is a collaborative effort between my group at the Australian National University and many groups in Australia, US, UK, China, and uh, Sweden, Italy, Russia, Switzerland. So beauty of science is that there are no national boundaries. We can all work together. And then uh, so many students and postdocs in these groups have contributed its work. And I want to thank all of them. Without their hard work, there's nothing much to talk about. And so this is my group at the Australian National University and I typically 10 to 12 nationalities at any one time and really bright young people. And then really it's a pleasure for me to work with all of them. And I also want to thank my senior colleagues, academic colleagues, those are leading various aspects of our research and also our funding agencies for providing for funding support to our research and which are allowing us to have fun. Here's the overview of my talk, and I'll give you the motivation why we're interested in uh, semiconductors and nanowires and then uh, nanostructures. And I'll talk about a wide variety of devices which we are really, you know, we are working on, and I'll draw some conclusions. Before proceeding further, I would like to thank uh, many groups, those are working in these fields, and uh, including in India. And really, in science, you know, the knowledge has been built on other people's uh, contributions, and really, it's important for us to really acknowledge and various groups, those are working in these fields. And uh, so opt electronics and what is opt electronics? So all of you know that electronics and then we are using electronics every day. And you know, for example, I know means uh, you're, you're, if you're using a computer and then of course there's electronics and they're all made out of silicon, for example. And uh, so the any smart device which you've got any electronics and most likely it would have been made out of silicon. But in the case of opt electronics and we are really converting electricity into light using light emitting diodes and lasers and are converting uh, light into electricity by using solar cells or photodetectors, for example. But unfortunately, silicon is not a very good light emitter because of its indirect band gap nature. So you need to have a direct band gap semiconductors in order to be able to emit the light. And then that's where we end up working on group three and group five of the periodic table, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium nitride, gallium antimonide, and a combination of these materials. The reason we work on different materials is that different materials have got different band gaps. That's the energy difference between the bottom of the convection band and the top of the valence band. And because of the fact that they've got different band gaps, they emit different colors of light, for example. So we particularly focus on three phase semiconductors because of the opta for opta electronics, you really need to have, you, you need to make use of particularly active devices, you need to make use of three phase semiconductors. Silicon has been quite heavily used nowadays for silicon photonics, which is mainly for passive devices. But for active devices, you really need to go for three phase semiconductors. So in fact, the developments in the nitride technology, gallium nitride, indium nitride, aluminum nitride led to the blue LED. And in the blue, this led to the Nobel Prize for these three Japanese scientists in 2014 in physics, for example. The materials which are used for making uh, LEDs can also be used for making lasers. And having the three uh, primary colors of these LEDs and uh, of LEDs, that means it allows you to be able to make white LEDs as well. In fact, my students are manufacturing millions of LEDs in China and other parts of the world, for example. Uh, today, I'm able to talk to you because of the fact of internet. 
And then in the case of internet, we are really translating electrical signals from my computer into optical signals using lasers. And we are sending that information using a modulator through an optical fiber. And on the, on the actual end, then we are converting that optical signal into electrical signal using photo detectors or photo receivers. And then you are able to really listen to me, for example, today. So the internet really operates in the 1.3, 1.55 micron uh, wavelength region, because that's a, the wavelength region where you got the minimum absorption and dispersion. So that's why people end up using these ones. The developments in the LED technology has led to large area displays and then also very bright LED uh, the, uh, TVs, for example. And then it allow, we, allow you to be able to see a TV in the broad daylight. In fact, this is an example of a Times Square in New York, for example, very old picture. With, but it's really allowing you to be able to do that sort of thing because of the high brightness of these TVs and the LEDs providing those TVs. The same materials which are used for light emission also can be used for light absorption. And uh, so that's where uh, we are making infrared detectors, which are useful for biomedical imaging applications and migration applications and the manufacturing applications. And also the same materials could also be used for making solar cells, which are more efficient, like 47% efficient. And mainly these are expensive solar cells, but they're used for the uh, space applications where the satellites are expensive, you want to have the most efficient solar cells. Now people are also exploring the possibility of using them for terrestrial applications. You got a solar concentrator, and then at the focal point here, they want to have the most efficient solar cell because the system cost is quite high for these concentrator systems, for example. That's where these multi-junction three-phase semiconductor solar cells have been used. Now let me come to the nano wires. Nano wires are seen as uh, uh, the the you know the building blocks for electronics and photonics and uh, what is so unique about the nano wires is that the lattice mismatches are no longer an issue lattice constant is a unit cell which repeats itself in a crystal and then as and when you got a larger lattice constant or smaller con lattice constant with respect to the substrate lattice constant either these materials expand or contract without creating any dislocations you can also create actual heterostructures like this green material is different than the red material also, you can dope these nano wires in various parts of PN junction, and in fact, which I will come back to. You can also create radial heterostructures or core shell nano wires, and also you can create a branch nano wires or so. So, in fact, here are some of the examples you know, from my own laboratory where we have shown galimantumonide can be grown on top of galimarsenide despite large lattice mismatch. You're able to show it can get atomically perfect galimantumonide on galimarsenide, and then particularly galimantumonide is good for infrared detector applications. You can also make indium arsenide nano branches like cantilevers here, for example, which could be used as cantilevers or for MEMS applications or for uh, things like, uh, you know, the scanning probes, for example. You can also create indium phosphide nano trees, which are very good for energy harvesting applications. And most recently, we are going from nano wise to nano membranes, which I will come back and then share with you. So many optoelectronic devices and sensors have been demonstrated as listed here and which I'll come and then share some of the examples with you. And also that uh, the recently the IBM Zurich has demonstrated indium gallium arsenide nanowire transistors on a six inch silicon wafer, indicating that for electronics also, these nanowires are going to play an important role. If the nanowires are so much of importance, how do you make these ones? And uh, so there are two main techniques which you use, metal catalyzed VLS growth process, vapor liquid solid growth mechanism, and another thing is called selective epitaxy. And we use something called MOCVD, metal organic chemical reporter version. But also there's an alternative technique called a molecular beam epitaxy. You can use either of the techniques because MOCVD is widely used in the industry. So that's why we've chosen MOCVD, for example. I put a droplet of gold nanoparticles, uh, which you can buy these colloidal solutions these days. And then 50 nanometer gold nanoparticles, we'll put these ones. And then you put it into the MOCVD reactor and heat it up somewhere between 370 to 500 degrees Celsius. And the substrate is gallium arsenide substrate. So normally gold has got a very high melting temperature, more than 1000 degrees Celsius. But once if it reacts with gallium or aluminum or indium, its alloy melting temperature comes down to as small as 350 degrees Celsius. So the eutectic liquid forms. So if you introduce the gases needed for the growth of gallium arsenide in this case, trimethyl gallium and arsine, these gases get incorporated as a liquid alloy, it gets supersaturated, and crystals start precipitating out. And you can see that you can get a beautiful gallium arsenide nanowires, which are beautifully cylindrically shaped with no tapering. And the transmission electron microscope image also has shown us that they're absolutely atomically perfect. And then the diameter of the nanowire is essentially determined by the diameter of the nanoparticle which you use. 
In this case, we use 50 nanometer nanoparticle, and you can see the gold nanoparticle on the top, and here is the gallium arsenide nanowire. This work is, in fact, my former student, Dr. Hannah Joyce, during her PhD, and now she's an associate professor at Cambridge University. And then we also work on selective epitaxy. In this case, we don't use any metals. Sometimes you don't want to use any metals. And uh, so you, you can really deposit some silicon dioxide using plasma and has chemical lipo deposition, put some photoresist, do electron lithography, create patterns of holes. You translate, transfer those patterns so that uh, you got silicon dioxide everywhere in these holes. Indium phosphide is exposed in this case because they're using indium phosphide substrate as an example. Then you put this one in the MOCVD reactor and you heat it up to somewhere between 60 to 750 degrees Celsius, introduce the gases needed for the growth of the indium phosphide, trimethyl indium and phosphine. These gases dissociate and nanowires really start growing here. You can see that the beautiful ordered patterns of these indium phosphide nanowires, you can see the top view showing nice, beautiful hexagonal facet structures or so. This is the work of uh, my former student, Dr. Chiang Da, who is now a research leader in Blue Glass in Sydney. We have taken these indium phosphide nanowires and excited it to a laser pulse and look at the light coming out of these holes. And then we try to quantify photoluminescence. We quantify the quantum efficiency of the light coming out of these indium phosphide nanowires and compare these ones with indium phosphide epitaxy layers or two-dimensional layers, which we normally use for making wide variety of optical electronic devices. You can see that you can get quantum efficiencies as high as 50% or so, which is of course dependent on the excitation power density of the laser. And then also you can see that the quantum efficiency of the nanowires and epitaxial layers is very comparable, indicating that the surface non rotary recombination is not a major issue in the case of indium phosphide. That means broken bonds which are got on the surface of the surface atoms of this indium phosphide don't, keep, don't give any defect stage which will lead to non rotary recombination. So that really helps you to be able to really use these indium phosphide nanowires for making lasers, LEDs, or solar cells and other things which I'll come back to. That is not always the case in the case of other semiconductors. For the case of gallium arsenide, for example, non rotary recombination is very, very high. So that means you need to really passivate the surface with aluminum gallium arsenide shell. So thereby the carriers cannot go to the surface. So then only you can get high efficiencies, which I'll come back to. So then we asked ourselves, in, if, you, if you got this mask, instead of opening a hole, what will happen if you open a slot or a ring? What type of structures we can really get? This is the work of uh, my student, former student, Dr. Nain Wong, who is now a postdoctoral fellow in the group. He spent about four years in optimizing various growth parameters like temperature, flows, and pressures, and all these things to see what are the best structures we can be able to really make. Again, you can see that in this case, uh, Nain Wong has opened this slot along a particular crystallographic orientation and then introduced into the MOCVD reactor and heated up to somewhere between 60 to 750 degrees Celsius which is the gases needed for the growth of indium phosphide, you can see you can get a beautiful nanomembranes, vertically standing nanomembranes here, instead of just nanowires, for example. And also these membranes have got a side facets of this particular type of side facets. If you open the slot along another crystallographic orientation, which is shown here, you do the same thing. And you can see that you can get membranes which are much thicker in, uh, with respect to these ones. But also in this case, you got a different facet of this particular type of facet here, for example. So really, this is a, it becomes thicker because some lateral growth is taking place, leading to this thicker membrane state, for example. And if you open the slot in between these two orientations, you can get these beautiful diamond-like structures with these alternating facets which I've shown you in these two examples. So now you can see that instead of just making nanowires, you can make thin nanomembranes, thick nanomembranes, nanodiamonds, and depending on the applications you want, you can be able to make any structures you want, particularly these nanomembranes are very good for MEMS applications, nanomembrane lasers, nanomembrane detectors, and other things which we are working with. So what will happen if you open a ring? You can see that you open a ring. Again, you can see these alternating facets and you can get a beautiful ring-like structure. And again, Nine Wong has spent a lot of time in optimizing growth conditions. I will not have time to go into the details of that. If you keep growing further, and the gap, this gap here in the middle gets filled up, and you can see if you keep growing further and then you end up finishing these horizontal membranes, which are really hexagonally faceted again here. So again, these could be useful for MEMS applications or membrane lasers and other things. We've also been using these rings as ring resonator lasers, which I will come back and then share with you. So Nain Wong has taken these nanostructures and then put it into a scanning electron microscope 
and excite these nanostructures with an electron beam and then really look at the light emission, the so-called cathode luminescence. And you can see that this bottom one is the light emission from all these structures. You can see very uniform light emission and then you can see that a very bright light emission as well, indicating that uh, nine months, uh, four years of hard work really has paid off in optimizing and growing these uh, uh, defect-free structures or so. So till now, I've spoken about materials. Let me now move towards devices. So all of us have studied about the undergraduate optics courses, and you need to create a laser. You need to have a gain medium. You need to have a laser cavity, putting some mirrors. You need to pump the gain medium to create population inversion. And then as and when the optical gain or the model gain is equal to the optical losses, the lasing starts taking place, for example. Okay. This equation says the same thing. Gain should be equal to the internal optical losses and mirror losses, then only the lasing starts taking place. This is a simple undergraduate optics course, for example. So if you take a nanowire, if you excite this one with the laser pulse, what happens is that uh, the light, the nanowire acts like a waveguide because of the high refractive index of the nanowire with respect to the surrounding medium. And then the both ends of the nanowire act like a mirrors because of the refractive index difference again. So also these nanowires are made out of three, five semiconductors like gallium arsenide, uranium phosphide. They also have got a gain. So that means you can see now suddenly, I don't have to do anything. If I design my nanowires right, each nanowire in principle should act like a laser. So again, we have been working on these lasers for a long time. And in fact, uh, my young colleague, Dr. Sudha Makapati, who is now an associate professor at Morash University, has, uh, while she was in our group, has been leading this particular research program and worked with many students here. And uh, Dr. Drew Saxena, who has de demonstrated gallium arsenide nanowire lasers, who is at Imperial College now, and Dr. Chian Gao, and who is demonstrating outside Indian phosphate nanowire lasers. Dr. Saxena also demonstrated gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide quantum well lasers. And then Dr. Tim Burgess, who is at IP Australia, has demonstrated zinc dope gallium arsenide nanowire lasers also. I'll not have time to go into the details of these ones, and then I will come back and then share with you one or two examples. So Drew Saxena has done a lot of simulations of these, uh, essentially solving the Maxwell's equations and uh, really look at these uh, on these nanowires, if they're acting like a waveguide, what type of optical modes which are really propagating through these particular ones, for example. So TM01 mode is on which he's showing here because this TM01 mode has got the highest intensity at the core of the nanowire, for example. If you're using a quantum well, because they look like ring-like structures, and the T01 mode is one, which is optimal one, for example. Depending on what you're doing, and you have to choose and design the, and these devices very carefully. To cut the long story short, and then based on the design of uh, Drew Saxena, my uh, another student, Dr. Jenny Jiang, now who is, a, is at Cambridge University, she's grown this gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide core shell structures, and about uh, 280 nanometers in diameter at about six microns long. And uh, we transfer that one onto a glass slide and excited with the laser and look at the light coming out of these ones. You can see there's a very broad light emission below threshold, like acting like a light emitting diode or a spontaneous emission. And above threshold, you see a very narrow light emission and a coherent light emission, stimulated emission. And you can also see the beautiful interference fringes because of the coherent light coming out of these nanowire lasers, for example. In fact, Drew Saxena has compared these simulations and experimentally measured interference fringes they match very well. It is the output versus pump intensity. You can see threshold-like behavior and log-log plot showing that the spontaneous emission here, amplified spontaneous emission here, and the lasing taking place here. And so the three requirements you need to have, and then the threshold-like behavior you have to show, log-log plot you have to show, narrowing of the line that you have to show, and we are able to demonstrate all of them. And then in fact, this work has been published about eight years back in Nature Photonics or so. And uh, so Drew Saxena's hard work and along with other students really paid off. So what are we doing with these lasers? In fact, this is work jointly with my colleagues uh, at the University of Strathclyde, Professor Antonio Hurtado, Professor Michael Stein, and Professor Martin Dawson. They developed a, something called nanoscale transfer printing technique. They come with a PDMS stamp and they can pick up these nanowires and they drop them wherever you want precisely. And a research fellow, Dr. Benoit Gulhaber, has spent a lot of time uh, in optimizing this particular technique and uh, developing the technique. You can see that these are the nanowires. So these are, are transferred onto a glass substrate and a flexible glass because we want to use it for flexible optoelectronics applications. You can see there are about four nanowires here, three here, two here, 
and we pump these nanowires and with the laser and then look at the light coming from these nodes. You can see that the light is coming from the both ends of the nanowire because nanowire reacts like a nan this nanowire laser, act like a fabric pyro cavity, and then indicating that all of them are lasing, indicating that this is a gentle process. We have not created any damage during this transfer process. You can see again threshold-like behavior, narrow line width, showing that we have really all these nanowires are lasing. So then we are also able to locate these nanowires in front of a Y junction, and is it like a, you know waveguides? That means you can use it for multiplexing and demultiplexing applications. And then you put these two nanowire lasers here, and you look at the light coming out of this one here, and you can see that a very bright light emission. And again, this is a PhD student in their group, Dimitar Jevtix, has spent a lot of time in optimizing this particular, fabricating these waveguides and also optimizing various conditions. So then we ask them, can you be able to locate these nanowires in nano antennas? So this is work of my young colleague, Professor Fang Fang Ren. Now she's a professor at full professor at Nanjing University, and she's been making something called you know, these terahertz metamaterials. So essentially, she's creating nano antennas of aluminium with a gap in the middle. And we requested them, can you be able to locate the nanowires in this gap here? You can see the close-up of this one. They're able to precisely locate these ones very nicely. When you do not have any nano antenna, and then what you get is a light emission from the both ends of the nanowire, which I've shown you earlier, because nanowire acts like a fabric pyro cavity. But once if you really put this nano antenna, the light gets engineered towards a vertical direction, and you suddenly start getting vertical emitting nanowire lasers. So now you see, you can, uh, depending on what you want to do, if you want to couple the light to an optical waveguide or a optical fiber, use these emitting lasers. If you want the light to come out of the surface of the screen, for example, for you know, uh, facial recognition applications or meta-optics applications or so, then you'll be making use of these vertical emitting nanowire lasers where you can create ordered patterns of this 2D uh, pattern of these nanowire lasers or so. Again, we, you know, this really created a lot of excitement within the community. So now let me come to these ring resonators, which I was mentioning to you. And uh, so these ring resonators, again, this is the work of my student, Wei Wong, is designed these ring resonators and then determining what should be the diameter of the ring, what should be the width of the ring, what should be the thickness of the ring, and again, you know, what particular modes which are really, really been uh, uh, propagating in these particular ring resonators. Again, based on his designs, he has grown these structures along with uh, Dr. Nain Wong, and also worked with uh, Dr. Ji Cheng Su and Professor Ho Tan. And then you can see that uh, he, he pumps these ones and look at the light emission. Below threshold, you see a broad light emission, like a light emitting diode. Above threshold, you can see the beautiful and whispering gallery modes. And he compares these ones with the experiment, the theoretically simulated ones. They are very much comparable with each other. And again, narrow line with above threshold, S-type behavior, and then threshold-like behavior, showing that his hard work paid off. And in fact, this work only came out this year, indicating that uh, the, the Wei Wong's uh, hard work has really paid off. And then essentially, we want to make use of these ring resonator lasers for photonic integration, photonic integrated circuits and other things. You can be able to put different ring resonators emitting at different colors of light. And, and again, uh, Wei Wong tells me these are the first ring resonator lasers grown from the bottom up. Most of the ring resonator lasers have been done from the top down etching process, for example. So till now, I've only shown you optically pumped lasers. So now, really, so we want to, what we want to do is that electrically pumped lasers because that's what industry wants, right? This is the work of Dr. In Su Kang, and then he's now uh, at Samsung as a research engineer. And then Imsuk has spent a lot of time in optimizing the doping, this indium phosphide with a P-type dopant, zinc acts like a P-type dopant. And then he has grown indium gallium arsenide quantum well, this yellow region here. And then the top contact is N-type indium phosphide, which is doped with silicon. Then he transferred them onto a glass slide, put some metal contacts with gold titanium by electron lithography patterning and everything. So now he injects current and look at the voltage drop or applies the voltage and look for the current. And then you can see the IV characteristics showing like a diode-like behavior, showing that, you know, in six hard work and he's paid off and he is able to manage, make a PN junction and also make good contacts there as well. So now if you inject the current into these nano, nano wires, uh, the diodes, and then you can see that the brighter light is coming out of these ones and higher the amount of current, higher the amount of light intensity, which is coming out of these ones. There are also two peaks here, one peak here and one peak here. That's mainly because there's a quantum well which is sitting on the top here, the actual quantum well, which is emitting at this wavelength, and the radial quantum well, which is here, and then that's emitting at this wavelength. 
And again, you can see that these are emitting in the 1.3, 1.55 micron window region, which I told you it is very good for optical fiber communication applications also. But if you go and look at the light output versus injected current, you don't see any threshold-like behavior. You don't see any narrowing of the line width here. So essentially, it says that they're acting like a light emitting diode, not like a laser. So then you can ask the question, how come? You know, you already got a PN junction and you make good contacts and uh, what is the problem and why you're not able to make lasers? The problem is when you put metals, these metals it got a huge optical absorption. If you create an optical absorption in this, in this metal region, you create a lossy cavity. You have to pump this cavity harder. You generate a lot of heat. Heat reduces the gain peak, and that means you have to even pump it harder. It becomes like a vicious circle. So now Nikita Gagrani, who came from IIT Karakpur, has been spending the last four years replacing these metals with some transparent conducting oxide like tin oxide and indium, you know, aluminum or zinc oxide, indium tin oxide, and other materials, so that uh, we'll be able to make good ohmic contacts without creating too much losses or so. It's truly a challenging project, and for the last four years, Nikita has been working very hard, but still we have not been able to do that one. And I am very hopeful that in the next six months or so, our, our hard work and efforts will pay off. Hopefully, we'll be able to show, demonstrate to you electrical injected nanowire lasers. Instead, before leaving, instead of making single nanowire LEDs, he's also created an array of nanowires by essentially, as I told you, the pattern structures. Which then he tries to fill the gap in these nanowires with a polymer material and select to etch the polymer by using plasma etching, expose the tips of the nanowires, put some indium tin oxide on the top, and on the side, a metal and the bottom metal so that you can inject current into these ones. You can see the IV characteristics showing like a diode like behavior. As in when you're injecting more current and more into PL, ear, electroluminescence intensity is increasing. In fact, you can see under the probe, very bright light in this case, you can see. Again, INSUC has spent a lot of time. And particularly, these, because you're embedding these things into polymer material, you'll be able to peel these things off. That means they can be useful for flexible LED displays, for example, because Samsung and Apple and others are interested in foldable phones, foldable computers, and others. So that's why INSUC really spent a lot of time in optimizing this, this particular process. So now let me move from LEDs and lasers to terahertz radiation. One terahertz is about 300 microns in wavelength, which falls between electronics and photonics. So in the case of light, we talk about ultraviolet light, visible light, and infrared light. In the case of electronics, we talk about microwaves, radio frequencies, and millimeter waves, and terahertz falls between these two. And why we're interested in terahertz radiation? Because of the fact that you got many of the chemical molecules, you got signatures in the terahertz parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And also, terahertz radiation is reflected by metals. So that means in the airports and all, nowadays they don't use X-rays because terahertz radiation is a non-ionizing radiation. That means it doesn't create any DNA damage to you. And still, they're able to detect these uh, metal objects, for example, if you are carrying any of them. They can be used for biomedical imaging applications. Like for example, looking at the cavities in the teeth or uh, uh, cancer detection and wireless communications where you can download movies onto your smart devices. Also looking at the water content in the leaves. So thereby the farmers are only watering the plants when they need to, uh, thereby uh, crops, thereby they're preserving precious resources like uh, water. Again, this work has been joined with Oxford University, Professor Michael Johnson and Professor Laura Hertz's group. And this work is also of my student, Dr. Kun Pang, and uh, who is now a postdoctor fellow at Oxford University. So what Kun Peng has done is that she transferred one of the nanowires onto a quartz substrate and make contacts using electron magnetography. Then we measure these things at Oxford University. We connect to the nanometer, we excite this nanowire with the laser pulse, and then you generate photocarriers and you come up with the terahertz pulse. Electric field of the terahertz pulse is the one which separates these carriers. You measure the photocurrent as a function of time. If you measure the current as a function of time, you can really uh, measure, uh, extract electric field of the terahertz pulse as a function of time and also measure the conductivity of the nanowire itself. And so that's why we're really, in fact, initially we're exploring uh, the electrical conductivity or electrical properties of these terahertz spectroscopy of the nanowire ensembles. We asked ourselves, can we be able to really detect uh, terahertz radiation, which is 300 microns in wavelength? But whereas our nanowires are only 300 nanometers in diameter and about three or four microns long, for example. To cut the long story short, during her PhD, Kun Peng has demonstrated gallium arsenide single nanowire detectors and uh, the indium phosphide nanowire terahertz detectors. 
you can see she creates this something called a bow tie antenna, and then you, you have got this nanovirus sitting in between this uh, the bow tie, for example, here. You can also see that uh, you get a very broad bandwidth uh, detectors as well, and the simulations and experiments really are very much comparable. And these nanowires are really as good as that of the bulk reference uh, detectors which people have been using in industry. Because these nanowires detectors are very, very small, that means you'll be able to put a multiple nanowires, that means you'll be able to really create high resolution terahertz imaging systems. And that's what my colleagues at uh, Oxford University now are uh, trying to develop these ones. So then most recently during her postdoc at uh, Oxford, and Kun Peng has demonstrated this polarization result terahertz detectors. In this case, she makes her initial detector like this one here. The challenge has been really try to have the another nanowire in the 90 degrees to this one. But when you do this one, the top nanowire should not be physically in contact with the bottom nanowires, for example. So that's what she spent a lot of time working with my colleagues at University of Strathclyde and Oxford and IANU, and then be able to fabricate these structures. So again, she comes with this stamp, and then be able to my colleagues in Strathclyde are able to really locate them after fabrication of the first device. What are we doing with these nanowire detectors? And again, we are really studying various uh, biomolecules and terahertz metamaterials also. If you take a terahertz metamaterial, you send a terahertz pulse, and this terahertz pulse is interacting with the terahertz metamaterial, its polarization properties and amplitude and phase are changing. So that means using our detector, we'll be able to measure both X and Y polarization, for example. You can see the actually fabricated device, and then also the, the uh, Kunpeng simulation show that the X polarization should have this particular pattern, and Y polarization should have this particular pattern, and then our measurements also are very much comparable to each other indicating that the Kunpeng's hard work has paid off. And last year, this work, particular work has been published in Science, for example. This is the work of my young colleague, Dr. Uh, Zion Li. And then she has been taking individual nanowires and creating nanowire arrays, because each nanowire acts like a resonant resonator, for example. So essentially changing the diameter of the nanowire, you should be able to tune the detection wavelength, for example, because essentially resonant wavelength is very much dependent on the diameter of the nanowire, for example. So then she's fabricated these uh, four different kinds of uh, the you know, nanowires of different diameters. And uh, so, of course, not a single nanowire and a multiple nanowires. And you can see the actually measured ones, and they're very much comparable to what we are really simulating. And in fact, we have taken an image of this one, original image, and then using our detector, able to really do the full color image of these particular structures. Again, this work has been published this year. And again, Xeon and many students and young colleagues have been involved. This work has been jointly with the University of Western Australia, Professor Laurie Ferroni's group, and uh, Professor uh, Wei Len Wei is also really uh, working with us uh, in, in developing this particular detector technology. These are visible and infrared detectors. So you know, sometimes the visible light may not be good enough. For example, if you've got a fog or anything, infrared light can penetrate through. That's why we end up using the infrared detectors as well. So that's why purpose of these ones is to be able to do you know, multi-wavelength detection. So now let me move towards solar cells. All of us have studied about solar cells, and then we have been told that you need to have a PN junction, and then you need to make it thick enough to be able to absorb this all the sunlight, and you have the contacts at the top and the bottom for a thin film solar cell, for example. But the problem is that the carriers are really far away from these contacts, and that means they need to migrate long distances, and you lose some of them for defects or impurities or surfaces. When you say a solar cell is 20% efficient and 80% of the carriers have been lost, for example. But whereas if you take a nanowire, you can make the nanowire as long as you want to absorb all the sunlight in the vertical direction. You can make a core shell PN junction nanowire, so thereby the carriers can be collected very efficiently. You're decoupling the light absorption pathways and carrier collection pathways, for example. Nanowires can also act like a light funnels because of the high refractive index of the nanowire. And then light really prefers to be in the high refractive index medium. Also, these they have also low reflection losses. That means you don't have to put any anti-reflection coatings or anything. Again, we've gone off and did a lot of simulations of what should be the height of the nanowire, what should be the diameter of the nanowire, what should be the distance between the nanowires or a pitch. And you can see that the most of the current is generated at the tip of the nanowire. As is a current is a higher the current is red one and the low current is the blue one, for example. So that means you don't need to make a very long nanowires, and particularly for gallium oxide or indium phosphide, one or two micron long nanowires are more than sufficient. And then again, we've looked at the diameter, and you can see the red means high current, and you can see that the diameter should be around 150 to 160 nanometers. 
diameter to the pitch ratio should be around 0.5 or 0.6. And again, these simulations are really playing an important role. This is the work of my young colleague, now who is at Glasgow University, who did PhD with us at the ANU, Dr. Vidur Raj. And then where instead of making P injunctions uh, in within the same material, what we have, he has done is, is made the P-type indium phosphide by MOCVD, and then coating this one with the N-type zinc oxide and aluminum doped zinc oxide using atomic layer deposition, so that we are really creating these so-called core shell nanowire solar cells. And again, essentially, to cut the long story short, and then we are able to demonstrate about 17% quantum efficiency of the conversion efficiency of these particular solar cells. And my colleagues tell me these are the best reported values for the radial, radial junction nanowire solar cells. There is still a lot of opportunities for improvement, but also in this case, we also embed these uh, polymer materials in the, within the nanowire. That means we'll be able to peel these things off for making the flexible solar cells, which could be in fact in the future, be able to be attached to your lab backpack and be able to charge your electronic devices, for example. Another area which we have been working on using nanowires for splitting water to generate hydrogen, for example. So how does it work? This is a photoelectrochemical cell here. And then essentially what you're doing is that you're exciting this uh, uh, photoanode, with a, which is a semiconductor with a, a, a sunlight. And then you generate photocarriers. Holes go and then oxidize water. Electrons go and then interact with the protons which are generated from this process. And then generate hydrogen, for example. Okay. This work is led by my young colleagues, Dr. Shiva Karaturi and Professor Kotan. So one of the challenges has been these semiconductors, either they're efficient, but not stable, but, but otherwise they're uh, the stable, but not efficient. So we are really trying to find materials which are stable and efficient. And we have been looking at gallium nitride nanorods, which are really done by the top-down approach. And this is the work of my student, uh, Dr. Dr. Reddy, and uh, now who is at engineering, and also Dr. Liu Yankoli from engineering. Gallium nitride is very difficult to etch normally. But whereas in, we have been able to show in this case, despite uh, the normal stability of gallium nitride, photooxidation takes place and it's not stable anymore. So we had to coat this gallium nitride nano rods with uh, cobalt oxide using flame pyrolysis technique in Professor Antonio Ficoli's group at in engineering at AEU. And we were able to show that if you really coat this uh, thin layer of cobalt oxide, you can be able to get a very stable structures, which looks very promising. But gallium nitride itself it is not the best material because it's got a too large a band gap. That means it doesn't absorb the visible light. We're exploring a wide variety of materials like indium phosphide nanowires and other materials as well to see that can we able to really create a stable, efficient nano, nano structures in order to be able to create most efficient uh, uh, the hydrogen generation process. So let me finish off with the last topic of brain repair. As all of you know that uh, all of us have got 80 billion neurons. And as and when you got a brain damage, you're really breaking this neuronal network, and then you really lose some other functions. You cannot speak, or you cannot move, or some problem or the other. We ask ourselves, can we really be able to create a neural patch and then be able to make these connections back? This is the work of my young colleague, Dr. Vini Gautam. She was in my group earlier, but now she's a lecturer in biomedical engineering at the University of Melbourne. So Vini has spent about two years in optimizing various conditions, uh, protocols, and then be able to grow these neuronal cells on top of these indium phosphide nanowires. You can see that the uniform distribution of these indium phosphide nanowires and these axons or neurites really like to follow these, these patterns beautifully here. You can see the dendrites which are coming out and making this, following these patterns as well. Instead of using a single neuronal cell, what will happen if you put a multiple neuronal cells? You can see in this box, you got a large number of neuronal cells. You can see these neurites and axons are really following these patterns of this two-dimensional pattern of these nanowires, for example. If these neurons are sitting on the planar indium phosphide substrate, you can see these neuron, these uh, neur neurites are really, really randomly growing, and they're not really following any pattern, for example. What Winnie does is that she puts some calcium dye, and then as and when action proteins have been fired by these, uh, these, uh, ion chan these uh, uh, neurons, ion channels are opening up, and calcium ions passes through those ion channels, and then you can see the change in fluorescence as a function of time. You can take the video of this one, then she creates correlation maps. If this neuron is firing, what's happening to this neuron and this neuron, these astrocytes and all. She compares these neurons which are grown on nanowires with respect to the plain glass substrates, and then really try to see the differences between them. 
So you can see that in the case when she is growing these neurons on glass substrates and change in fluorescence intensity as a function of time, essentially changes the calcium concentration that determines the change in fluorescence intensity. You can see that they're all really firing randomly. You see very little correlation coefficient here. But whereas the neurons are grown in neophosphate nanowires in ordered patterns, you can see that all these neurons are firing at the same time. You see excellent correlation coefficient indicating there is some sort of a synchronized and correlated activities taking place. Then Winnie presented his work at a neuroscience conference and then in Melbourne, and then they were quite excited about it. And they were asking what neurons you're using. They said that she has been using either rat or mice neurons. And then she said, uh, uh, the, they said, well, how about using stem cells? So in fact, we are taking the human stem cells of the you know, stem cells from the Alzheimer's patient and then stem cells from the healthy people and then creating this something called a brain organoids or mini brains, and then try to introduce in a controlled way the microglia and really measuring the signaling behavior differences and applying the deep neural networks or artificial intelligence techniques in order to be able to really see the differences between the signaling behavior or so. And then also developing nano electrodes to be able to really measure the signals from a single neuronal cells. And also later on, we want to be able to introduce drugs and then see which neuron, which drugs are really effective in terms of treating dementia and arthritis. This is really a multidisciplinary project involving stem cell biologists, neurobiologists, computer scientists, and us as a physicist or material scientists and nanotechnologies. It is a multi-institutional project as well. This has been funded by Dementia Australia Research Foundation and the Gilbert Foundation. Uh, so the really, you know, this is what really fun part of life is that, you know, always willing to learn something new and then go and work with and collaborate with people. So thereby we can always learn something new and make an impact in the field as well. With that, in conclusion, nanowires and nanostructures open up opportunities for the manipulation of light matter interaction at the nanoscale and developing new class of lasers and LEDs, infrared and terahertz detectors, integration of optoelectronic devices on various platforms and solar cells and PEC water splitting and also engineering the growth of the neuronal networks. Finally, I want to leave you with some information it's been mentioned that, uh, you know, I'm an editor in chief of the Applied Physics Reviews, and in fact, its impact factor now is 19.162. And uh, so, really, if you've got something major breakthrough or you want to read the high impact reviews, think of Applied Physics Reviews. Our current rejection rate is 90%. So, please don't send every paper, but think of something you got a breakthrough. We got a center of excellence now for a seven year funding on transformative to meta optical systems. And then again, we once in a while advertise uh, PhD students and postdoc positions. And please keep an eye on this website. It involves about five different universities, and you can apply to any university using this one. Also, my considering that I, as I mentioned, that I started my life in a very small village in India. And uh, as a gratitude to my teachers and my parents, and also my wife's uh, uh, parents and uh, teachers, and uh, many people, those who helped both of us. We started an endowment to support students and young faces coming from the developing countries to come and spend some time at the AANU during the summertime. And in fact, we have been able to get a few students from India and other parts of the world. And then 2019, and we had about 52 students because the ANU also opened a new program called Future Research Talents Program. But unfortunately, during the last two years due to COVID, we are not able to really host anybody. And then we are hoping that in 2023, we may be able to host some students. Please keep an eye on that one. And this mainly targeted towards undergraduate students and master students, with the, really just to give them the research experience so that they get excited about research and then hopefully choose research as a career. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Participants, now I would request if you have any queries, uh, you can unmute yourself. Please ask to the speaker one by one. Uh, thank you, sir. Don't feel shy. You can ask me any questions. It doesn't have to be science as well. Okay. As I told, as has been told that, you know, I failed so many times and even uh, I'm happy to share any of the failure questions and life questions as well. Yes. Professor Jagdish, I have one for you, if you could allow. Sure. Please do. Yeah. Professor Jagdish, so based on your experience, how do you see Indian research going uh, in terms of photonics in, uh, in the near future? How's the trend? Yeah, so uh, uh, yes, I will thank you very much. And uh, so basically, the uh, photonics has been uh, uh, the sort of a emerging area in India. And there's a lot of potential. And uh, so, for example, I've been chairing the advisory committee of the uh, you know optics and photonics center at IIT Delhi recently. And based on our recommendation, 
and then you know, you know the, the governing body of the senate of the, the institute have approved a starting a new optics and photonics center for example and iit madras have got an active program iic has got an active program in various parts of the you know means iit guwahati has got an active program and uh, so many places there are lots of interesting things are happening in fact recently uh, i think uh, uh, last year or year before and then we had something called a vibo summit the prime minister has launched that one and they one of the verticals they have chosen is photonics and in fact i was co-chairing that one with uh, professor mohapati and uh, from isr uh, bhopal and then again we have identified various areas which you know india should be investing or so so it's an emerging area there is a lot of potential out there and it's a matter for us to really target some areas identify what are the needs of india and then what technologies are going to really help the people in india and then we can really start making progress there sort of okay the purpose of this summit was to really bring the uh, indian scientists and the overseas scientists to come together and then thereby it means uh, in a overseas you know lot of uh, you know wherever people are you know for example and you know in, as has been mentioned today that i'm always be considered as you know australian of indian heritage or indian australian right so to an indian american or in, in you know in in you know, indian british or whatever it is so that means you know because india is the one which really provided all my education for example by the way i don't have any overseas degrees all my degrees are from india i'm also going to share with you i have never been able to get into any iits my phd was from delhi university for example okay also i studied in my uh, mother tongue uh, in till i finished my year 12 it doesn't matter you know how difficult your life has been what language you studied and where you come from and all these things everything is possible in life in my view anyway i hope i've answered your question absolutely and uh, uh, even though i congratulated you on linkedin for being elected as the president of hostel academy of sciences but i never had the opportunity to congratulate you in person so even if it is not person but directly i can uh, tell that thank, this thank, is thank wonderful you, and you truly yes. deserve it this thank position. you thank you thank you thank you now much again you know that's anyway but that's what i'm saying that you know for all of you those are iit indoor the absolutely sky is the limit Absolutely, sky is the limit. Yeah. Participants, any further questions? Any further question? Hello, sir. Or comments? Feel free. Yeah, uh, sir. Uh, this is Ishu Kumar, uh, yeah. PhD scholar uh, in material science uh, from IIT Indore. Yeah. Sir, uh, I am working on soft materials, kind of uh, metal organic gels. So uh, preliminary, I found that uh, whatever gels I am synthesizing is uh, synthesizing. It is Uh, highly conducting in the range of uh, 10 to or minus 1 Siemens per centimeter. So I just extended this works towards device means preliminary characterization. So, sir, could you comment on organic electronics? Uh, my material is kind of uh, potential to be uh, promising towards organic electronics. Yeah, which means that organic electronics there's a lot of potential out there. For example, the already organic LEDs are available and organic displays we are talking about and even. Uh, Samsung has created some uh, curved TVs and other things because of the flexibility of the organic LEDs. As I was mentioning, the organic materials are very good for flexible devices, and of course, perovskite solar cells are really playing a very important role. And even organic materials could be useful. For example, in fact, uh, I've, I've been, the waveguides which I've shown you are the SU eight is which a polymer material example, for example. So there's a lot of potential out there. You have to think about you know where I can use, make use of my material for applications where it makes most relevance. Instead of trying to say that I want to use it for everything under the sun, okay, this particular gel which I am making has got particular, you know, means a conductivity or so, and can I use it for sensors, for example, and then you know what type of changes I can really be able to create, and uh, then you know what you know, for what are, for example, by changing temperature, what's happening if I shine light, what's happening, and then that can really help you depending on where and what for purpose you can be able to make use of these ones. Organic electronics and uh, organic uh, Uh, photonics also has a role to play and again it's a matter for you to choose where you want to really make use of this okay sir thank you sir good luck any other question for our speaker more question sorry uh, good afternoon sir Uh, sir, Hi, I am Somerajan Pradhan. Sir, can you explain your experience uh, in PhD? PhD experience, can you explain? 
what, what I means basically my phd experience uh, was a tough one to be honest with you in those days i used to borrow the you know acetone and methanol and uh, trichloroethylene from my chemistry friends those are doing their phds the single crystals uh, which we were able to really get is that i used to go to electrical shops and get some mica and be able to cut with the scissors and cleave that mica then that's the single crystal substrate for me that's the only thing which i could afford i could not even afford silicon for example i used to go deposit these sin films using a just a simple evaporator and then i used to go to geology department to be able to do uh, the x ray measurements and i used to go to university of roorkee in now of course iit roorkee do some transmission electron microscopy or scanning electron microscopy i used to go to defense science center in uh, delhi to do the laser annealing for example and i used to do the electrical measurements in my own laboratory sort of thing so it has not been easy it's been a very challenging time but at the same time you learn a lot how to collaborate and how to really go and really make use of the facilities in other uh, you know other uh, other universities other institutions so now you know we i collaborated with people from 30 plus countries and then we published jointly together see we cannot be experts in everything you cannot expect to have all the facilities in your backyard you really need to be willing to go and work with other people and collaborate you know i used to take a bus and then go to roorkee from delhi and i spent two three days there they used to have something called usic university services instrumentation center and then you know i used to be able to do some measurements there for example so it's been a challenging time honestly speaking but i've learned a lot as well Yes, sir. Hope I answered your question. Sir, actually, my uh, I want that. Uh, sir, I want to uh, your experience uh, of a PhD. That's best thing I want actually. Pardon me. Pardon me. Sir, actually, you were say that uh, what is your experience of a PhD? Actually, how you are collaborate, how you are uh, working, what is your experience? That thing, sir, I want. Yeah. Anyway, but now you mean actually, I told you that you know we I had to collaborate and go to you know sometimes you know. You used to go to geology department. You have to wait for some time to be able to access X-ray machine and then on and so the, you know, I mean, but you know, but being friendly to other people, you know, you always be nice to others. You know, the others are willing to really accommodate you. In fact, uh, the technician who used to look after the X-ray machine, as soon as he used to see me, he used to disappear and then he used to go off and do something else. You know, go to some shopping or do whatever he was or otherwise doing some other things, because he had the confidence that I can operate the machine well and then he trained me well, sort of thing. so that sort of relationships so human relations play an important role in research as well as scientists are also human beings and you know we really need to develop those human relations and work with other people your know, team effort is absolutely critical somya for example thank you sir uh, any further question for our speaker hello this is kushal sir yeah uh, go ahead kushal yeah so th- first of all i would like to say thank you very much for sharing your experience and your research that is very interesting and has intrigued me uh, towards you know towards the direct uh, detectors as well i mean i had worked previously on the terahertz uh, sources but now since that i have seen your work on the you know non nano wires and uh, what kind of applications this can uh, you know uh, take under the umbrella of nano wires only so uh, thank you very much for that and uh, my question was about the fact that uh, you said that uh, uh, you know uh, there was a vertical uh, nano wire for the photo uh, photo cell uh, for the solar cells right so uh, uh, my question was about the fact that how do you you know give the contact to both the sides like you have grown the nano wire that is perfectly fine then you can give the top layer a connection as well i mean how are we actually uh, you know kind of giving the uh, electrical connection to the bottom of it i mean since we are growing it on the polymer only right okay no 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 but we are going on a semiconductor substrate and then we can make the contacts from the bottom for example oh okay 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 yeah okay but of course we have right. also made the flexible leds which i didn't mention what what you do is that in that case uh, kushagra there is that we really peel these things off yeah. and then try to deposit at the bottom uh, another contact as well or oh, by by flipping it uh, mechanically you or know, just say you deposit you know with uh, you know sputter deposition or you know I means evaporation or depending on what particular metal you are trying to deposit there or uh, indium tin oxide or yeah. what of the material which you are depositing there sort of thing and in fact uh, we have demonstrated in fact uh, i think uh, my student nikta agrani has really submitted a paper 
which is really demonstrating some, uh, you know, the flexible uh, LEDs based on peeling it off and making a bottom contact as well. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that, sir. Also, sir, since you have told that you have, you know, done all your uh, study in the India and then you were able to, you know, kind of get this kind of uh, achievement that you have right now with you. And that is very, uh, very inspiring for me. And I would like to, you know, uh, see myself doing research in the futures. Thank you. Um, good, good luck, uh, Kushagra. Again, I can tell you that uh, I had to change my field from semiconductors to magnetism okay. in, during my postdoc at Queen's University because nobody was giving me any jobs in, at that time because we used to get to see, at that time there was no internet or there were no computers and then we used to get the magazines like Physics Today and IEEE Spectrum by C mail six months later to the library. They never used to give you deadlines and we didn't know whether the deadline is over or not and I used to apply for it. I used to apply for everything. And then I used to get rejection letters from everywhere. And in fact, a friend told me that this professor in uh, Queen's University, and he seemed to be, he seemed to like people from Delhi University. And then that's how I came to know and I applied. But then of course he told me also, he doesn't work in your field, he works in magnetism. I said, okay, I can always learn something new. And yeah. I had to go and learn from the basics of magnetism, for example. And then because ex except for electricity magnetism in my bachelor's degree, I didn't know anything about magnetism. I didn't do any research, but you know, we can always learn. So yeah, that's that is what the point is. Actually, you know, since I have uh, told you that I have worked on the uh, sources side, now since uh, I've been trying to you know switch myself and uh, pursue the higher degree in the research only for the PhD side. So uh, so uh, uh, since you have said that this is a challenging thing, and since you have uh, you know yourself changed the uh, field. So this is kind of a, a very uh, challenging for me these days because you know uh, nobody really likes to take uh, of, of someone who has no experience of that particular field only. So yeah, this is a big challenging. So I mean, of course, by the way, we also work on Tarahar's uh, sources, but we don't use nanowires and we have been working in uh, taking standards, uh, semi 3 5 semiconductors and doing ion implantation to really reduce the lifetime. And it demonstrated uh, in a wide variety of uh, uh, terahertz sources jointly with Oxford University. And then I was mainly focusing on nanowires in this particular example. So, you know, so anyway, but everything is possible. What I would do with Kushagra is that, you know, just go and start with the detail in, uh, sources first. So that means people feel comfortable that, you know, you're really suggesting what you can do. Then gradually yeah. move towards detectors. So thereby, you know, then you can be able to do these things. Sometimes, sometimes my students come and say that, oh, I want to try this one. My, my supervisor is saying I should not do this. I say that, look, you know, you don't have to tell your supervisor everything you're doing, you know. You got plenty of time at your disposal and go and do something and then you get a good result and go and tell your supervisor. And if you didn't get a result, good result, you don't have to tell your supervisor. You know, this is within my own group. I tell my students like that. Okay. okay. They, in fact, you know, they, they, it, it, we encourage students to really try their own ideas. You know? It's important okay. to try that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll keep that mic. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question we can take, uh, if you can permit. Sir, uh, I have a couple of questions if you allow me to go through. Okay, okay. please do, okay, sir. Uh, sir, your work is actually uh, excellent and it is very inspiring, first of all. Second, uh, Thank you. I have learned from this talk uh, initially that, uh, okay, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, you know, just controlled or it is just regulated to one particular area. It has a wide applicability and you have really explored it very through. I, uh, what I wanted to uh, particularly uh, point out to that, uh, I'm from the bioscience background. So uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that there are not just neuroscience applicability of this particular kind of uh, structures or this particular kind of uh, research or expedition. There are more of that. Like uh, what I wanted to uh, explicitly point to is that I'm working in the domain of sensing. So we are trying to do multiple kind of analyte sensing at once. And since you're working with the nanowires and most of them are conducting, we have a different kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, spread of conductivity and uh, uh, combinations of different kind of uh, structures and materials as well. Are you working on uh, that domain as well to figure out like some of the sensors or not, not like just like the optonic, uh, optical sensors, you might be converting into the optical field as well, but most probably the sensing part towards the environmental samples. We, we have been working on it. In fact, uh, I think uh, I think uh, I think we recently published a paper in uh, 
uh, I think nitrous oxide sensor. And uh, I can't remember that uh, if you send me an email or search my name with the uh, sensors, you know, means uh, we, you'll be able to really find that paper. And okay. we have, we're indeed, we're using nanowires for sensors. Uh, and uh, so this uh, student uh, called uh, she, uh, she you, she you and then she was the first author of that particular paper, but you can type my name and then you'll be able to find it as well. So yes, absolutely. We're using nanowires for sensors as well. Yeah, good point. I will go through this but, information. But the problem self -self. is that because, uh, you know, means I've already covered so many topics, you know, with the, within the limited time, I didn't want to introduce one more topic sort of thing, you know. So it's otherwise okay, yes, we're working on sensors. Yeah, absolutely. I will dig more on my own, sir. Sir, sure. one Thank more you. question. Uh, that's more yeah. of the general thing. Why do you think that uh, such a higher rejection or such kind of, you know, um, barricading in scientific publications is is there or it is needed as per your uh, experience, as you think that it is needed or it is already, you know, just following the already precursors uh, kind of rituals? No, but see, we, we've got different journals, so we've got different rejection rate. It, everything is dependent on the scientific quality. Okay. Generally, you know, we got, I've been editor for various journals and others. We always look for the first and foremost, the quality of the science. Okay. But these applied physics reviews, we started this one as a select journal where you really want to really publish only the high impact research. Because we got other journals, you know, applied physics letters, journal of applied physics, and you know, various other journals are there. They're already covering that one. And then we just want to make sure that, you know, we are also, sometimes what's happening is, People are really nowadays crazy about the impact factor. Okay. Everybody wants to chase a nature paper, sort of thing, for example, nature journals and all. So in the process, you know, the, the but our view is that look, you know, means there is the we said, okay, we can also provide opportunities. Uh, for example, in applied physics, you know, there's no nature journal, for example. Of course, they got in nanotechnology and photonics and all these things. So materials and all. So that's why we said, okay, why don't we really create a journal which can really people, those who want to really publish in a high impact uh, journal, and then they'll be able to do that sort of thing. Sometimes what happens is that we feel that that really doesn't meet the impact quality. And then we say that, why don't we transfer our paper to some other journal within our uh, portfolio of uh, American Institute of Physics publishing uh, portfolio sort of thing. Okay, so at the same time, to be honest with you, it doesn't matter where you publish. Of course, it doesn't have an impact in terms of finding a job. Letters and all these things as well. So it, it, I mean, at the end of the day, good work gets really cited in the longer term. Okay. But important is, you know, what is the audience which you're really trying to reach to? That is very important. See, if you go and, you know, your audience is some uh, one particular community, but you're really publishing in a journal, which may have an impact factor, but, you know, that particular community doesn't read that particular journal, and it gets lost. Yes, sir. So that's what we always try to target, you know, which, which, you know, which, which community will be interested in this particular work, and you go and that particular publish in those particular journals. Sir, one last, and then I will uh, leave you with the sure. rest of the people. So uh, just uh, with your experience, that, that is very wide and they're very applicative uh, in the current research and technologies that are translational to the real world applications. All I want to, uh, want to ask is that how do you think that why we are so lagging into transform since you are leading in some of the uh, uh, domains which are still under expedition or still uh, less explored. So how do you think that why we are lagging to transform these kind of findings, these kind of uh, you know, break uh, breakthrough uh, kind of technologies into the real world because all I'm seeing is that there is very much talk about solar cell and the new energy sources rather than fossil fuels and the already existing technologies. But yet we are somehow very short on that to convert our or save our environment. That is one part of the climate change that we can change immediately. Yes, absolutely. That's a very good question. So the 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 challenge is the cost and manufacturability. So everything which you're really doing in the lab doesn't uh, need not necessarily be really manufacturable product sort of thing. Now you're only sometimes really using these things to really demonstrate an idea, for example. But then you know those devices potentially could be useful, potentially not. That's something which the commercial world need to make this determination. In fact, I started a company in 2000 to commercialize some of our laser technology. We had a world record output power, and the funny thing is that you have to learn quite a lot about you know how to do the packaging of the devices. In the lab, you know, you can have a probe station and you really demonstrate a working device.
But if you want to make it into a product, you know, you really put it onto a heat sink and you need to have the right kind of solder, you need to couple it to the optical fiber. And all these technologies in the university sector, we don't have the expertise. Most of the industry has that sort of expertise sort of thing. So that's why you know we need to work with industry and then develop those uh, skills. So thereby we'll be able to really translate these things which are doing in the lab into the real world. And then also that uh, we are also now, trying, for example, this hydrogen generation thing. Hydrogen is seen as also a clean energy source, and also transportable energy source and a storable energy source. Okay, so that's why we are working on this one. In fact, we are at the moment discussing with uh, a company which is very keen on really trying to take some of the technology which we are developing in our laboratory and then to commercialize that one sort of thing. What I'm finding is the sometimes, you know, you may start a company and then you have to put a lot of effort and other things, particularly young people, I encourage them to do that. You know, now, you know, I'm 64. So, you know, at, at that age, you know, you don't have the same energy as when you're 34. When I started my company, I was 40 and I was working in you know, 16, 17 hour days and I was seven, working seven days a week and one week in the Silicon Valley, one week in Canberra, so then I was traveling like crazy sort of thing, right? And suddenly communications market collapsed and then suddenly our investors pulled out. So the market conditions are something which is not in our hands. And the second thing is also that, you know, in order to commercialize something, it doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize winning idea. What you need to identify is that what is the market gap and then how do I go and then make sure that I fill the gap and then it'll be all right. So for example, my collaborators in Oxford University you know, one of my one of my colleagues started this, you know, the Oxford uh, PV, and based on perovskite solar cells, for example. You know, but of course, the stability of the perovskite solar cells is something another thing which we still need to address, for example. So it's a matter of you know, I means trying to either you go and start encourage your students to start the you know uh, the uh, you know startup companies and other things. But again, the ecosystem is also dependent on the you know different countries have got different ecosystem. Why in America they are more successful? In Silicon Valley, you get a multiple companies doing multiple different things. So if I'm making a laser, I don't need to really develop the packaging. There's a company next door who is doing the pigtailing of the lasers. The other company is doing the facet coatings. The other company is doing soldering. That means you know I can there's heat sinking. That means I can leverage on everybody and then I can be able to bring my idea into a product very quickly. But in Australia, I didn't have any of those things and I had to do everything on my own. That means, of course, that means you're learning something new. It takes a long time and the market up opportunity may disappear, for example. So that's why the timing is very important as well. So that's why the governments have an important role to play in terms of providing infrastructure. And then of course, you need to have the good VC community, which are willing to take the risks and be able to invest in these te in the technologies as well. You know, for example, Perk solar cells, which have been discovered and developed by my colleague, Professor Martin Green at the University of New South Wales, they are worldwide, they are used, for example, in the silicon solar cells, for example. There are many, many examples. Another colleague of mine who is Andrew Holmes, he developed some, you know, organic semiconductors, which are quite heavily used in solar cells, as well as also in the LEDs and other things as well. So, you know, being at the right time, at the right place with the right technology is an important one if you want to make something commercialized, like commercialization as well. But for young people, my message is, you go and give it a go, even if you fail, the experience which you gain for in those two, three years period, you know, then you know that can be a life-changing experience for you. I've learned a lot during my, my you know starting a company, so I have no regrets. You know, the people may say that I failed to really commercialize technology, yes, but I've learned a lot. Now I work with industry and the way I look at it quite differently. I work with my students, and in the university sector and institutions, we try to really solve problems. And by working with industry, Instead of trying to identify a pseudo problem and thinking that you go and to solve the pseudo problem, you can really solve the real world problems. Because that's what we want to do. We want to solve problems and train, of course, our younger students and postdocs, right? That was There's really, a lot of really... there. I encourage young people. I'm a strong believer of, uh, you know, means uh, a knowledge based economy, technology based economy, and then going away from the resource. In fact, when I got elected, uh, I've been announced that I got elected as. Uh, incoming president of the Australian Academy of Science. And I said, we really need to move from the resource-based economy to the knowledge and, uh, you know, the technology-based economy. So I'm a strong believer of that. But then, and this is, future is in your hands, young people. Yes, sir. Thank you very we much for this insight, you, sir. But then you need to really have that, you take the, you know, run, uh, reins and then run with it. Sure, sir. I'll keep it in mind, keep that in mind. Yeah, but you, you, you have the energy, you are young, and then you've got a lot of potential ahead of you. Good day, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Th
Thank sir. you, sir. Thank you, sir. And now I would like to uh, request Professor Shabal Mukherjee to please, sir, uh, if you can share a thank you note uh, with our speaker. Thank you so much, Professor Jagdish, for you know spending some of your time to grace the occasion and give an, uh, we should say, public lecture also on this platform. I, I know like you uh, had been quite busy. Most recently, you have also given a talk uh, in the IEEE Nano uh, chapter organized by IIT Jodhpur by one of my uh, colleagues. So I got to know from my PhD student, Mayank and Pavan, that you had been extremely busy. So, you know, sparing some amount of time uh you know to give an invited talk over here so it is really you know heartfelt so we, we sincerely give you our heartfelt thanks for this so i was quite fortunate uh, to meet you and uh, subu way back in 2019 when we had this iwphd conference in calcutta organized by uh, professor samitra so it will be really wonderful to also meet you soon probably in future i do not know Roughly, probably this time IWPhD is being held at IIT Delhi and it is done on a virtual basis. So hopefully this time I will not be able to meet you. But another, you know, uh, uh, international collaborators of ours is uh, Sharat Sridham from RMIT. So we used to talk about you a lot <laughs> when we this time thought about planning some Indo-Australian uh, project for this one. So we got to know and discuss with you. And many, many of the students and faculty members uh, present today with us, they do not know that Professor Jagadish is also associated with us as one of the international advisory committee members for the newly established Center for Advanced Electronics in IIT Indore. So we are very much, you know, privileged to have an eminent personality like you uh, with us for uh, such a long time. So thank you so much once again, Professor Jagadish, and through your talk and listening to you and uh, your humble gesture. So it inspires many of us, not only students, but also young faculty members and colleagues of many like us. So we are very much grateful and thankful to you. And also uh, like uh, Mayank and Pavan, they have made a small plaque of honor to give it to you so soon they'll be in touch with you to know about the address to which it should be sent because i was hoping to meet you probably sometime in india this this year but it may not be possible thinking about the still there is another trend of covid is coming to the picture so we'll be planning to send it to australia to you so they will be in touch with you sir sure so thank, thank you, you so much, much once and then uh, thank you mayank and pawan also for good luck to all of you and i'm always there to help and anytime, if you have any questions, and feel free to send me an email, and then I'm happy to steer you in the right direction. And good luck. Thank you very much for again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.